today, it's my great pleasure to introduce the current SWISI president, president, Dr. Elizabeth Cole. Liz received her BA from Boston University. She then earned her MA in clinical psychology and her PhD in personality psychology, both from the University of Michigan. She then spent her first several years at Northeastern as an assistant professor, then an associate professor in psychology and African American studies. She then returned to Michigan, where she's remained since, where she is currently a professor of women's studies, psychology, Afro-American, Afro and African studies. And in addition, she's held a number of leadership positions while at Michigan, including associate dean for social sciences, and she just finished the past year as interim dean for the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. <laughs>
She was SPISI president between 1998 and 1999. She served as the inaugural editor of ASAP, a SPISI journal uh, called Analyses of Social Issues and Public Policy. And she was also a committed mentor to early career scholars. She was a stalwart SPISI member throughout her life. And today I consider SPISI my organizational home. And it was Rhoda who brought me back to that home. I'm also thrilled to be giving this talk right at this moment in my own career because I'm about to leave administration and return to my primary roles as a scholar and teacher. And as Wendy mentioned, for the past nine years I've been serving in administrative roles. Um, and in the past year I've been the interim dean of my college. Throughout this time, questions about speech have been getting my attention repeatedly. Um, sometimes it's reflecting on my own experiences, um, thinking about how am I able to speak now and because of the roles that I hold. And this is a picture where I got to uh, give a commencement address in front of tens of thousands of uh, graduates and families. Um, I'm thinking about what are people not willing to say to me because of the roles that I hold. And what can I do um, as an individual, um, as someone who thinks about these things, to try to facilitate those conversations. I've also watched some difficult dilemmas about speech unfold from this vantage point, and they've stayed with me, kind of scratching around the back of my mind. Um, there were high-profile incidents on my campus involving controversies over whether figures associated with prejudice and hate could speak, like Richard Spencer and Charles Murray. And last year, our former dean in his commencement speech at that same event, uh, event Andrew Martin, uh, choose to use his time to uh, emphasize the importance of free speech. That's what his whole address was about. He talked about the importance of free speech to universities um, as a place of knowledge and learning. And for those reasons, he said, we should never cur curtail free speech. And the alumni loved it. The response to the speech was tremendous. But I felt conflicted. You know, everything he said, I believed, but I still felt uncomfortable. It was kind of nagging discomfort. Um, I felt instinctively that defending this right so that Nazis can have a big platform can't be what freedom of speech is primarily about. Um, I had this sort of um, gut reaction that something important was outside the frame of these conversations. And writing this address gave me the chance to reflect on and synthesize these thoughts. As I thought more about this, I returned to one of my favorite things I learned from Rhoda Unger. <laughs> She used to say, and this is a picture of her, she used to say, if they can get you to ask the wrong question, it doesn't matter what the answer is. So channeling Rhoda's question to think about free speech, I want to think with you tonight about what if the conversation paid attention to voice and justice when we talk about free speech? How would that change whose speech we're concerned about protecting and in what context? When censorship is at the center of the frame, we ask questions like, is it ever okay to place limits on speech? And if so, when? And that leads us to pay attention to the people at the boundaries, people inciting hate and violence. But if we put the everyday speech of minoritized people at the center, I start thinking about who gets the floor to speak? How do norms and socialization affect decisions about speaking? And who gets hurt? And how is the freedom to speak unequally distributed? In making this move, I really draw inspiration from the reproductive justice movement. And Wendy mentioned the Global Feminisms Project. This is Loretta Ross, who's a key figure in that movement. Um, she was the executive director of Sister Song, which is an umbrella organization for women of color reproductive um, justice movement um, organizations. And um, we interviewed her as part of the Global Feminisms Project, and I wrote about her in an article in 2008 in Sex Roles. Reproductive uh, choice has long been a key site of feminist movement, but the reproductive justice uh, movement takes that in a different direction, asking, how might considering the circumstances of diverse women, diverse with respect to race, class, disability, complicate what we mean when we think about reproductive choice? Um, and a great example of this is that in the March for Women's Lives in 2004, Sister Song was approached and asked to be one of the major organi organizers of that event. Um, and Loretta, in her interview, um, recounts that story. Um, she talks about how Sister Song responded that if we're going to be involved, um, the march has to be broadened beyond abortion rights 
to look at all the ways that the reproductive freedom of women of color is constrained. Um, she said reproductive concerns of women of color also include the right to have children. And this is a direct quote. She said it includes uh, the right to parent the children that we have. If you look at the foster care system, the criminal justice system, the zero tolerance policies, kicking our kids out of school, I mean, reproductive rights means a whole lot more than whether to abort or not abort, as far as we're concerned. And just by the way, I gotta get my Swissy plugs in. Um, AJD and Deanna Steffens are right now um, editing a special issue of JSI on reproductive justice. So if you're interested in this, you should watch out for that. Uh, what also came to mind in thinking about that kind of move, what if we put uh, someone else in the center and think about it from that perspective, I was also inspired by my colleague Sarah McClellan's work on intimate justice. Um, she thinks about sexual experiences from the perspective of women and um, sexual minorities and shows the ways that that move shifts our frame to notice the way people think about deservingness of pleasure. Um, and because of that, she shows that our, our ways of understanding, our instruments for understanding sexual uh, satisfaction are really fundamentally flawed. Both these framings do this feminist work of shifting the questions by beginning from a different vantage point. So what I'd like to do tonight is invite you to think with me about some of the ways that starting from the perspectives of the marginalized could um, change how we think about what it means to be free to speak. Um, at the most fundamental level, who gets to speak is determined by who's even in the room. And the segregation of our neighborhoods and institutions means that often those rooms are not very diverse. This affects the conversations that we can have. Um, and I have a great uh, demonstration of this or illustration of this. This is a photo from an installation we had on our campus called Ghosts. And it was inspired by an op-ed that was written by a historian, uh, Matthew Countryman, called um, The Missing Students of Color and the Rest of Us. Countryman reflected on the impact of Proposal 2 on our campus. Proposal 2 was a 2006 ballot initiative prohibiting the use of race, gender, and other social categories in education and public sector hiring. Countryman calculated that after 11 years of this policy, the university was missing about 1,100 students from underrepresented groups, students who would have been on the campus if the university had been able to maintain the percentage of um, students from underrepresented groups who had been enrolled before uh, Prop 2 went into effect. In this installation, they put a folding chair on the dyad to represent each one of these students. And even though 1,100 doesn't sound like a lot, it was just a vista of these empty chairs. Um, in his essay, uh, Countryman said that on a campus of 30,000 students, 1,100 students is not a lot. But uh, he went on to say, the loss of these students has fundamentally remade the campus climate and the educational environment. Why did the loss of this relatively small number of students have such a significant impact in my classroom? The answer lies in the idea that it takes a critical mass of minority faculty and students not only for students of color to thrive within a predominantly white institution, but also for the entire campus community to realize the educational benefits of racial diversity. We typically think about policies that exclude in terms of blocking some groups from opportunities. But as this uh, example really shows, exclusion also brings silence, and that has an impact on the whole community, a community that might not even be recognized. But who's speaking isn't just about who's in the room. Um, it's also about what happens when they get there. Who speaks, how long they hold the floor, who interrupts. And social psychology can actually can tell us a lot about that. The power of interruptions to silence came into our awareness vividly in 2017 in an exchange between Representative Maxine Waters of California and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin during a House Financial Services Committee hearing. Um, if you aren't familiar with this uh, event, committee members get a set amount of time to speak, and uh, Waters was questioning Mnuchin, but he kept avoiding answering her questions and then speaking over her. And so over and over again, Waters demanded that she was reclaiming her time. Um, it was such a kind of um, vivid uh, descent to this kind of interruption that we often see that it became a meme and even a catchphrase because it really struck a nerve. 
I would argue that although Representative Waters' response to Mnuchin was unusual, her experience at the hearing was not. So what does the research say? Is that just sort of an anecdotal impression? Well, no. Um, in a 2007 meta-analysis, Leeper and Ayers looked at gender differences in speaking and language use. And they looked at many, many variables, and mostly they found a few gender differences, and the ones they found were not big. Um, but they found a few that were really telling for this discussion. They found that in mixed gender interactions, men tend to talk more than women. The duration of men talking tends to exceed the duration for women, um, which suggests they control the floor. And this is also supported by another meta-analysis that shows that um, speaking time is uh, correlated with uh, dominance. Uh, men are more likely to engage in intrusive interruptions, which is different than sort of an affirming interruption, um, speaking over rather than affirmations. And the topic mattered too. Uh, men talked more than women during discussions of impersonal topics, and there the effect size was 0.8. Um, and they also talked more when there was uh, decisions being made. And I would argue these are public sphere types of behavior. So that's where we really see men holding the floor. Um, and women being silenced in some ways. So taking together these findings, co uh, collected over many studies, suggest that one way we don't really have freedom of speech in everyday life is that speech, especially when it's not about self-disclosure or talking to children, um, is unequally distributed by gender. But now I want to take a deeper dive to talk about some of the ways that these inequities come about. The image of an activist with tape over her mouth has become a visual trope on the left and on the right. When I Googled it for this talk, I found that you can even find stock photos of this image. Um, and I think it's a complicated image that's really designed to elicit emotion. It conveys the idea that power, the powerful are forcibly silencing some opinions. Um, but interestingly, it's kind of dual-edged. You also find variations on this image used in um, very misogynistic memes. I put this up here um, just to sort of gesture to the point that overt uh, censorship is only the most obvious way that women are silenced. And feminist psychology can tell us a lot about that. In the early 90s, Dana Jack wanted to know why women had higher rates of depression than men. And based on interviews, she proposed self-silencing as a mechanism. She argued that women don't express themselves in order to avoid conflict in relationships and retaliation, so they hold back. Um, she said this is so part of our culture, it's part of the way women are socialized. And she uh, eventually went on to develop a measure of this that had several dimensions, and one of them was called divided self, which results from the feeling of a split between your real self and the way you present in relationships which uh, starts to give you a flavor of kind of the potential impact of um, women silencing themselves. Since the early 90s, there have been decades of research on self-silencing that have supported Jack's theory. There have also been some studies that have kind of complicated this. I can talk about that later if you want. Um, but most of them have been focused on the, on the impact of self-silencing on women's mental health and well-being. Um, so various aspects of self-silencing are associated with Depression, negative body image, lack of sexual agency, all these ways that suppressing um, these speech is um, turned back on women. But in the last 10 years, some psychologists have taken this in another direction to look at how self-silencing is related to women's responses to inequality. Of course, it's probably not a surprise to anyone in this room that experiencing sexism is associated with distress for women. But interestingly, this distress is mediated by self-silencing. So in other words, women who report experiencing more sexist events report more self-silencing, which is then associated with more distress. Um, it's as though sexism itself shuts women up. And this is a picture of an um, op-ed that was in The Guardian where a woman talks about um, her experience with sexual harassment, um, her decisions not to speak out, and the impact it had on her personally. Um, Watson and Grotebiel in 2016 found a similar pattern to the one I just talked about where um, uh, sexist events led to self-silencing, which was uh, in turn associated with distress. But they added another uh, complication to this. They found that that association between um, uh, 
experiencing sexism and self-silencing was actually buffered by having a commitment to social change. So the kind of activist orientation actually was protective uh, for, the, for women about the negative impact of self-silencing. But I want to take a minute to talk in more depth about what does that really look like? What does it mean that women self-silence when they experience sexism? And I want to tell you a study about a study that Janet Swim and her colleagues um, published in JSI in 2010. She had college women, they had college women keep diaries of everyday sexism and their responses to it. Uh, they had a list of events that other women had offered as examples of sexism. So the women in the diary study would check off if they had any of those experiences, and then they were asked if they wanted to respond to them, and if they did. And this graph shows what they found, and if, it, if the print's too small, I'll walk you through it. Um, so about a third of the time, the women in their study, and this is the gray bar on the left, um, they experienced an event that other women thought was sexist, but about a third of the women in the study didn't want to say anything. But when women wanted to say something about sexism, they were almost just as likely not to. Okay, so 31% um, said nothing, 37% said something. Um, and then those last two bars on the right show that when the women did say something, they were more likely to only say part of what they wanted to say. Okay. Um, but what's more, part of the um, pre-testing for the study involved um, filling out a scale about your belief in whether women should self-silence to preserve relationships. And women who believed in self-silencing were less likely to even want to respond. So it's not just about keeping your mouth shut. They didn't even want to say anything when they had these experiences. So taken together, these studies tell us that self-silencing is associated with an array of negative health outcomes, including depression. And women rarely say all of what they want to say when they encounter sexism. Um, sometimes they say part of it, and more often they don't say anything at all. This is really concerning because those mediational analyses I talked about show that there's a mechanism where sexism leads to women self-silencing, and that in turn is associated with distress. So there's a little bit of good news that if you have a commitment to social change, that path is buffered. Um, and so you could say that the whole picture is that um, speaking up is really powerful, right? It has the potential to protect women as individuals and to change our culture, right? But I would argue that's only part of the story. There are serious reasons why women don't speak about sexism. And one reason is stigma. So we, many of us in this room are probably aware of the uh, many studies that show that women who act outside of prescriptive gender norms face backlash, right? It's not nice to say anything. And that backlash is real, like you've seen that it has um, career impacts. But I want to look at another way that stigma silences women, and that's by centering the experiences of African-American women. <laughs> Probably the single most formative book in my own academic path um, has been Patricia Hill Collins' Black Feminist Thought. And I was lucky enough to meet her in, uh, shortly after it came out in 1990. And she told me that she wrote that book based on her lecture notes from class, um, which has served me for decades of sort of an inspiration that you don't have to think about your scholarship and your teaching as sort of forever in conflict. One of the chapters that I think has been discussed the most describes long-standing stereotypes of black women the historical genesis of those stereotypes, the way they're perpetuated through media and politics, and the consequences of internalization for black women. But truly, I think uh, the parts about internalization were somewhat speculative at that time. But in the 30 years since the book was published, psychologists have explored the impact of these stereotypes on black women, both the consequences of believing these stereotypes or endorsing them, and even just awareness that other people hold the stereotype of the group. Importantly, these stereotypes are associated with black women adjusting their behaviors in response to the stereotypes. So um, just to give you one example, there's been a lot of research on the stereotype of black women as um, unusually strong and resilient, the strong black woman stereotype. And um, strong black woman endorsement among black women is associated with negative well-being, including binge eating, uh, sleep disturbance, and postponement of self-care. But interestingly, in light of my previous uh, section, 
Um, Self-silencing mediates the association between endorsing the strong black woman stereotype um, and depression. Okay, so it's a different story, but kind of same path. What I want to do is focus on another stereotype, and it's one that really has gotten a lot less scholarship, um, and that's the angry black woman. The stereotype of black women is loud, overbearing, domineering, emasculating, and angry. Collins called this the sapphire stereotype based on a character from Amos and Andy. You may not know that despite the prevalence of this stereotype, research doesn't support the idea that black women are um, angry as a, as a trait. Um, Wally Jean did a study in uh, 2009 where she compared black women's scores on the state trait anger expression inventory to the scores from the um, reference group that had been used to develop the scale. Um, and on the global measure, she found no group differences between black women and um, other populations. And even more, contrary to the stereotype, black women actually scored lower on a subscale called angry reaction, which is the tendency to react with anger in response to criticism or negative treatment. So, Contrary to the stereotype, the truth is actually the opposite. But media scholars have shown how this image is nevertheless repeated over and over again in media. Um, and here you've probably seen this image. This is um, Michelle Obama uh, uh, in 2008 during the Obama campaign, depicted as aggrieved, radicalized, and dangerous. Political scientist Melissa Harris Perry, who you probably are, is better known in her role as an MSNBC host, but she's also an accomplished scholar, uh, wrote a book called Sister Citizen, and she described the danger of this depiction, which she called a cultural projection. She said, the angry black woman stereotype holds black women responsible for power they do not possess, power that is in fact being utilized in very real ways by members of other social groups who can claim emotional innocence as they hide behind and persecute the, quote, black bitches of our cultural imagination. So prevalent is the stereotype that managing it becomes its own burden. And this collage is from um, a project called I'm Tired, with, in which um, people made photographs of words written on the human body to um, illustrate the impact of microaggressions. Um, and this woman says she's tired of being the angry black woman. Clinician Carolyn West argued that internalization of the sapphire stereotype could lead black women to adapt their behavior to appear unthreatening. Interestingly, she said black women are going to adapt their behavior both to appear unthreatening to um, other ethnic groups and to black men. Um, and she said that this move means that they're essentially taking responsibility for the discomfort and fear of others. And that study I mentioned earlier by Wally G really backs that up. She found that more than the reference group, younger women reported suppressing their anger. Black women's awareness of the stereotype um, and the way they're affected by it was also supported in a focus group study by Jeannie Lewis and her colleagues. Um, they asked black women about their experiences with microaggressions, and having this expectation imposed upon them was one of three specific forms of microaggressions that black women reported. And they felt that they had to self-censor to manage that reaction in others. One of their respondents said, I always have the stigma of the angry black woman and so I kind of have to tone down my passion for whatever it might be. Now some might argue that black women and other members of stigmatized groups just shouldn't pay attention to what others believe about them, that the goal should be you know, to ignore other people's prejudices and get on with your business. But paying attention is a coping strategy. Low status groups manage their interactions with members of high status groups by paying attention to the stereotypes that the outgroups hold, because the outgroups mostly control the resources. Um, and in a study of 2008, Lammers et al. showed through an experimental manipulation of power that when people have less power, they pay more attention to the stereotypes that the powerful have about them. Okay, and so that shows why a student like this at Harvard might use her moment uh, during the hashtag movement, I'm to Harvard, to make a statement about the angry black woman. This comes at a psychological cost to black women. Um, in a paper that I wrote with uh, my colleagues Morgan Gerald, Wendy Ward, and Denise Avery, um, we found that black women who reported being more aware that others hold negative stereotypes of their group, and this was the full array of stereotypes, 
reported more negative mental health systems, and this in turn was associated with lower levels of self-care and higher use of substances for coping. So there's a lot of, um, you can pull together a lot of different um, pieces of evidence from the literature and psychology to think about how these stereotypes are silencing, but I wanna close out this section by uh, talking about one more um, really insidious aspect of this stereotype. That the stereotype of the angry black woman serves to discredit the views of the woman who has this stereotype imposed upon her. It, ne it neutralizes the real critiques that black women make. Um, and this was explained uh, really beautifully by Sarah Ahmed, who you may know from her work on diversity. Um, she, uh, speaking as a woman of color, she said, you might be angry about how racism and sexism diminish life choices for women of color. Your anger is a judgment that something's wrong. But then in being heard as angry, your speech is read as motivated by anger. Your anger is read as unattributed, as if you're against X because you are angry, rather than being angry because you're about X. You become angry at the injustice of being heard as motivated by anger, which makes it harder to separate yourself from the object of your anger. And in becoming angry about that entanglement, you confirm their commitment to your anger as the truth behind your speech, which is what blocks your anger and stops it from getting through. So the stereotype itself um, in this uh, telling um, becomes a mode of silencing. In this way, the anger women of color feel about injustice is deflected back onto the speaker and dismissed as a character flaw, rather than as a valid critique that needs attention. Fricker calls this epistemic injustice when the speaker's identity is used to undermine the value of their, just, of their knowledge. So you could think about this discussion of stereotypes faced by black women as a case study that shows the multiple levels of stigma that lead to self-silencing. Black women's efforts to avoid appearing to confirm the sapphire stereotype may hold black women back from making uh, demands in the political sphere. These demands are personally stressful, and then by depicting black women as irrationally angry when they do make claims, those claims can be dismissed as unreasonable. So now I want to put these observations together about absence, interruption, self-silencing, and stereotypes to think about what a justice-based model of um, freedom of expression, um, especially as it pertains to college campuses, would look like. I was very um, influenced in my thinking about this by a book by a philosopher um, named Seagal Ben Cora uh, called Free Speech on Campus. And um, she did this beautiful move where she rejected the choice between the goal of freedom of expression on the one hand and creating a safe and um, an inclusive campus on the other. Often these are sort of presented as a trade-off. Um, she said if the mission of universities is to create a space where knowledge is created and shared, we need to pursue both these goals simultaneously. Because without inclusion, we miss out on important contributions um, of all the groups, and especially the groups who are silenced. The goals of freedom of inclusion and not, are not in conflict. They're both essential. And framing them as fundamentally in conflict, I think, is another one of those bad questions that Lord Unger uh, warned us about. Ben Porath calls weighting these two concerns equally, holding them both in your mind and thinking about how to achieve both ends. She calls that inclusive freedom. And she says that to achieve it, we really have to change our practices on campus. So the first thing I'm going to argue is that a justice-based model of expression is going to attend to both aspects of inclusive freedom open expression, and creating a climate of inclusion. But because we spend less time talking and thinking about how the goal of inclusion is key to free speech, um, we need new tools to recognize the ways that speech can be constrained other than uh, censorship. So the second feature of a justice-based model of expression is that it pays attention to how speech is constrained, silenced, and invalidated and thinks about how this happens at many levels. And that's really what my talk has been about, right? Speech can be constrained legally, like through censorship, which we mostly think about. It can be uh, constrained structurally through inequality, how different groups are marginalized from certain spaces, segregation, economic injustice. It's constrained interpersonally through conversational norms. It's constrained intrapersonally through self-silencing, when we silence ourselves. And then finally, it's constrained representationally 
through these controlling image that, images uh, and stereotypes that Patricia Hill Collins taught us about. Of course, these operate synergistically, um, as we saw when the images of the angry black woman lead to self-silencing. But I think thinking about this in a multi-level way gets us to notice things that kind of weren't even present in the debate, as it's conventionally framed. The third element is dignitary safety. In recent campus debates on free speech, people, often students, who bring concerns about safety and inclusion into the debate are often characterized by their opponents as wanting protection from ideas they don't agree with. Or sometimes they're even uh, said to be um, wanting to be coddled. A justice-based model of expression takes the concerns they bring seriously. And not only because protest is another aspect of free speech. Ben Poreth makes this important distinction between intellectual safety, which is not wanting to expose, be exposed to challenging or um, challenging ideas or ideas you disagree with, with dignitary safety, um, which is the sense of being an equal member of the community and being invited to contribute to a discussion as a valued participant. Okay. Intellectual safety has some problems, right? Not wanting to be exposed to things that offend you, but dignitary safety is really fundamental to having all the voices in the community contribute to the discourse. But thinking about the safety in terms of dignitary safety and taking that seriously and thinking about what's our responsibility as faculty and administrators to provide that, that is largely missing from these public uh, framings of the free speech debate on campus. On my campus, we saw this demand for dignitary safety eloquently expressed by students who participated in a movement called BBUM in uh, 2013. BBUM was a hashtag that stood for being black at Michigan and um, our students uh, tweeted about their experiences of marginalization on campus. This attracted uh, national attention and became a movement um, and led to a, a series of protests against the low representation of minority students and the problems with our climate on campus. This really brings me full circle back to the problems that were addressed in the ghosts installation. That in the context of underrepresentation and resulting lack of critical mass, <coughs> We can't create a climate in which diverse perspectives can be spoken. And then we don't have a context in which the benefits of diversity can be realized. My goal in this talk has really been to reframe the debate about free speech on campus by putting the perspective of marginalized groups at the center and then to kind of lightly survey research in psychology and sometimes beyond that can support that reframing. Um, I focus primarily on areas where I've been very involved in the research, but there are a lot of others, right? So I touched on the backlash literature, Redmond and Glick, the penalty paid by agentic women who don't conform to norms of niceness. Um, I, you may have been lucky enough to hear the panel um, led by Isa Settles and um, Nicole Buchanan on epistemic exclusion, uh, when faculty of color are not recognized for their achievements and contributions which um, ironically are often contributions that help us understand the perspectives of minoritized groups, right? What if we also paid attention to voice when we think about epistemic exclusion? That's another way we don't have free speech on campus. Um, Kimberly Rios has done work on the conditions under which minority opinion group members are willing to speak up. So there's many other ways you could take this. Um, I know we would all like to go have some wine. <laughs> by returning to my Rhoda's observations that if we ask the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what the answers are. We spend so much time on free speech talking about it in terms of censorship. And part of that conversation is inevitably about the cost for security when controversial speakers come to campus. We don't usually think about the costs in terms of our attention. In protecting the rights of these exceptional speakers to have a platform, we rarely look at the cost of not attending to the ways that people are silenced in conversations on our campus every day. This is one of the powers of a feminist analysis. When we begin from the experiences of marginalized people and think about power, we see so much that had been left out of the picture. If faculty and administrators thought about the limits on everyday free speech, we have to think not so much about can Richard Spencer talk on our campus, but um, what about our climate? What about our norms for uh, conduct? How are we training our community to listen? And arguably, these are much more difficult problems to tackle. 
We have to think about this every day, not just when the Nazis want to come to our campus. We have to learn and think about the ways we all participate in constraining the speech of others. And there are a lot of faculty on many of our campuses, and many of them are SPUSI members, who are doing that important work, and it would mean we would have to take seriously how to support that work and make it available. That's a big ask, um, but I hope that the frame I've sketched out today can be the beginning of a way to think about what's at stake if we don't bring these issues into the frame. And now I want to close by uh, kind of throwing down a challenge. Um, last year, Wendy managed to uh, get a picture of her dog into her talk. Um, <laughs> and so I vowed that I would do the same and then extend that challenge to our incoming president who has two dogs. Um, so this is my dog, Nelly, um, who's named after Nelson Mandela. And um, she wants to know if you have any questions.